general, one of the things that we'll see is up until up until uh, this point, remember we've seen uh, we've looked at all these other organisms, and here we've seen we're seeing uh, we're going to continue looking at coelomates. Uh, but differentiating the mollusks, annulids, and arthropods is going to be our deuterosome development. Our echinoderms and our chordates undergo deuterosome development. Um, then we're going to take our chordates and then we'll start to break them down into fish, which is the most diverse group of vertebrates. Um, these live in mostly aquatic environment, in most aquatic environments on Earth. Uh, lakes, streams, ponds, bottom of the ocean, freezing polar waters, wherever, we're going to see our chordates. And you can see as we break down, um, the presence of vertebrae, remember our lanicets and tunicates are invertebrate chordates. Uh, and then our first vertebrate is going to be the jawless fish. The addition of jaws will give us our cartilaginous fish. And then the presence of lungs will give us our bony fish. Um, while these three types of fish can all look differently, there are several similar characteristics. Most have vertebral columns, jaws, paired fins, scales, gills, and a single loop circulatory system. Uh, so let's take a look at our first characteristic, jaws. Um, most fish have jaws, except for our jawless fish. Um, the anterior gill arches are what evolved to form jaws. So if we take a look, these are our anterior gill are our anterior gill arches and as we move we can start to see these start to separate and now here we're starting to see that jaw like characteristic until we actually have a jaw with this hyomandibular uh, bone uh, remember the hyoid is the bone in humans, um, if you take anatomy, if you think about a human's jaw, right, there's a little bone that sits, like it's kind of floating right in the, underneath your jaw, that's your hyoid bone, and you have your mandible in general, meaning, um, meaning jaw. Uh, uh, why? Why is the evolution of the jaw important? And uh, we should be looking at this was going to allow us the ability to prey on a larger range of animals. Fish are going to have paired fins. Um, paired fins, there's going to be uh, there's going to be a dorsal fin. Uh, oftentimes there may be two dorsal fins. Uh, here we're going to see it along the back because dorsal means back. So here we have our first dorsal fin, and then oftentimes we'll see a second fin, uh, and we can call those the anterior and the posterior dorsal fins. Um, the what we would call a tail fin is actually called a caudal fin. Um, caudal is opposite of cranial. Um, so our cranium would be up here. So our fin that's opposite of our cranial area is going to be our caudal. So our caudal fin. Off the sides, off the sides of the fish are going to be our pectoral fins. And, and notice these fins are going to be coming from about that center part of the body. And then underneath it is our pelvic fins, these attach to the bottom portion, the bottom portion, so our pectorals are the midline from the middle, our pelvic fins are from the bottom, and then towards the back is the anal fin. Uh, each of these fins are going to uh, be responsible for something different, uh, but mainly we're looking at balance, uh, forward momentum, forward movement and, uh, and steering to be the three main reasons that fish have fins. The, uh, the evolution of the jaw and the paired fins allow for fish to become more predatory and live in a much different, uh, much different habitats. Uh, looking at the scales, uh, scales help protect fish from scrapes, parasites, uh, other external injuries. 
and um, there's a variety of different types of scales. Uh, real quick, uh, the vast majority of bony fish, um, bony fish are any, any uh, fish that have jaws but not uh, shark skates or rays, they have uh, cycloid. Um, you might see uh, the prefix for cycle. Um, so cycloid scales, and if you notice, these, cell, these scales happen to be, tend to be a little circular or rounded. Uh, they have two basic parts, the inner solid structure, which is made out of bone, and an outer collagen layer. Uh, these scales are not shed as the fish grows, but grow with the animal, um, and the number of scales on these fish don't increase. Again, these scales grow with the uh, animal, and as a result of that, we can use um, the growth rings like trees and clams, we can look and we can see these growth rings and these growth rings can tell us the age of the fish. Our second type of scale is the neoid scales. Uh, they're, close, they're very closely linked to cycloid scales and um, the two groups are often grouped together, uh, simply talked about as bony ridged scales. Um, it's similar, it's a similar uh, to the cycloid scales except the posterior end, uh, so this part, the exposed part of the scale uh, is lined with spines. Um, vast majority of the fish, uh, vast majority of fish have one of these two types. Uh, flounder, flounders uh, actually have both. Uh, ganoid scales are rare among modern fish. They're usually found on uh, really old fish like gars, sturgeon fish. Uh, they act like armor to, and are fairly impenetrable. What's unusual about these is they don't overlap but instead fit together. So when you see this is like chain mail or armor. These uh, fit right together and don't overlap like we do in some of the others. Uh, these scales also grow with the fish, uh, not only in length, they not only get longer, but they get wider and thicker as well. Placoid scales, uh, also known as dermal dentricles, uh, are tooth-like scales found on shark skates and rays. So our cartilaginous fish are going to have these placoid scales. Um, unlike the previous types of scales, Placoids don't grow with the fish. As the fish, as the shark gets larger, new scales are made to fill in the gaps. Um, as you can see, there's this sharp ridge right down the center of the scale, made out of an enamel-like substance. Um, that enamel is a hard substance, very similar to what's covering our teeth. And this enamel ridge is called the ectodermal cap, which is important because without this enamel cap, the sharks wouldn't be able to feed. Um, and the reason they wouldn't be able to feed is that technically sharks are toothless. Um, what we call teeth are simply modified dermal dentricles. Um, the poisonous spine on the tail of a stingray that killed uh, the crocodile hunter uh, is the same thing. It's just a greatly modified placoid scale. Uh, another characteristic of fish are the gills. Uh, fish are able to get oxygen from the water. Water enters the mouth and flows across their gills where oxygen then diffuses into the blood. So the water is going to come into the mouth and those, um, that it's going to come over the gills and then out the side of the mouth, or out the side of the gills. Um, gills are, are composed of thin filaments. They're highly folded. Um, and the reason that they're highly flo uh, folded is they want to create the greatest amount of surface area um, possible. One of the things to notice here is that the blood flow and the water flow are in opposite directions. Uh, the reason for this is this opposite direction allows for about 85% of the oxygen dissolved in water to be removed because of this. If we look up here, this upper clump is a movable flap, is a movable flap that covers the gills and protects them. Uh, it also aids in pumping water coming into the mouth and over the gills. 
Um, some fish, like lungfish, can spend some time out of the water for short. They can spend some short periods of time out of the water because of a primitive lung. Um, and eels, some eels can get oxygen through diffusion of their skin. The uh, the single loop closed circulatory system that we mentioned, the heart, it's a two chambered heart with an atrium and a ventricle, is going to pump blood out to the gills where the blood will become oxygenated and then continue to pump through the body um, and then back into and then back into the heart. Notice the one-way loop from the heart to the gills throughout the body and then returning to the heart. Um, again, that heart consists of two main chambers. Uh, it's analogous with parts of our own heart. The atrium the atrium is going to receive deoxygenated blood from the body, and the ventricle is going to be responsible for pumping the blood from the heart to the gills. Um, and this is going to happen. Our heart is actually four-chambered. Still, the atriums are going to be receiving the blood, and the ventricles are going to be responsible for pumping blood out of the heart. So notice okay, there's, a large, there's large muscles cardiac muscles surrounding those ventricles because we're going to be able to contract and push that blood wherever it needs to go. Um, with the evolution of the jaws, fish were able to become predators. The organs of the fish digestive system are similar to other vertebrates. Most fish swallow food whole, passing it from the mouth, passing it from the mouth into the esophagus, uh, and then from the esophagus and then from the esophagus into, uh, into the stomach. So from the mouth into the esophagus and then into the stomach. Uh, stomach is where most of the digestion occurs. From the stomach, the food moves to the intestines. Uh, some fish have a pyloric cica, which are small poucher, which are small pouches. So these small pouches, these are the pyloric cica. Um, that secrete enzymes for digestion and absorption. We also see the, like I mentioned, we also see the liver. Uh, it's important for a number of things. It assists in digestion by secreting enzymes that break down fat. It also serves as storage for fat and carbohydrates. Um, also important for destruction of old blood vessels and in maintaining proper body chemistry as well as playing a role in nitrogen excretion. We see the gallbladder. Um, we see the gallbladder on the underside of the liver, just like we'll see a lot of times. Uh, often going to store bile, which is created by the liver. We're going to see the pancreas, and the pancreas is going to be here, off of the intestines. Uh, our pancreas produces several important hormones: uh, insulin, glucagons, um, pancreatic poly uh, polypeptides. Uh, it's a digestive organ secreting pancreatic juices containing digestive enzymes that assist in absorbing nutrients. Um, as far as the excretory system is concerned, we're gonna, we see the kidney, which filters waste materials from the blood. Um, it's extremely important in regulating water and salt concentrations within a fish. Um, some uh, it, it's just going to kind of depend on if a, if a fish is salt water or fresh water. Uh, there are some fish uh, that can actually survive in both. Um, fish have highly developed brain and nervous systems. Uh, the most anterior part of the fish's brain contains the olfactory. Um, the olfactory bul bulb leads to the optic lobe. The optic lobe processes, processes the information from the eyes, uh, and then we go and we see the cerebellum, which coordinates body movements, and then the medulla oblongata, controlling the uh, internal balance of um, of the fish. Uh, most fish have superbly designed sense organs. Uh, fish like trout and salmon, which are active in the daylight, have well-developed eyes and color vision. They also have extraordinary senses of taste and smell. Uh, 
Chemoreceptors are located all over the head and much of the body surface. Um, and we can see, we can start to see some of this in this um, lateral line. It's what's, what's called a lateral line. A uh, lateral line is a series of pores connected to can, uh, canals beneath the skin that cover the head and the sides of the body. Um, it detects motion. Um, some fish, uh, electric eels, catfish, sharks, can actually detect the electricity that's given off uh, by other bodies. Um, majority of fish have external fertilization. Um, so the male fish waits for to spread sperm over the female fish that lays eggs in the water. Um, the fish have a swim bladder. Uh, the swim bladder's main function is a uh, hydrostatic organ. Um, the ability, it's, it allows the fish the ability to use little or no energy to stay at particular levels of the water. Um, it is involved in the expanding and shrinking of the swim bladder. Uh, without a swim bladder, uh, fish with body tissues denser than water would sink. Most, uh, most ray finned fish have over the times converted their lungs into swim bladders. The swim bladder is an oval sac shape found in the fish's abdominal cavity, which at different times can be filled with varying amounts of compressed gas, allowing it to go up. So if we have a um, swim bladder's muscles relaxing, it's going to get bigger, uh, which is going to allow more gas, which is going to allow the fish to float. Whereas if that fish wants to contract, the swim bladder gets smaller, less gas in there, uh, so the fish will, fish will sink.